Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Lisbon UX. Welcome to another edition of Lisbon UX, the second edition in TalkDesk, actually. Today, we're going to talk about context and how uh, context is important for design. And it's several different ways. We're going to have three talks, one by Ivo Gomes, who works at TalkDesk, another one by Hugo, who is over there, another one by Gonzalo, who is over there. And then we're going to have a panel discussion where you all could participate, obviously, in post questions and interact with everybody, okay? So that's kind of the structure overall. So I'm going to leave it to Ivo to start. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about how context impacts design here at TalkDesk. But first, I need to introduce you to some, con to some concepts. First, what is context and how, what is contextual design? Then I have to explain to you what is TalkDesk and what we do in order to explain to you how TalkDesk uses context for its designs. So starting with context, first, I also need to explain to you about the concept of affordance. Uh, so object, objects around us can communicate with us through their shape, uh, through their uh, size, the material they're made, of, they're made of. For example, if you look at this uh, faucet, uh, you don't have, you don't have uh, have to read instructions to know how to use it. You just look at it and the object speaks, speaks for itself. You just turn it and water comes out. Same thing happens if you look at the doorknob. You look at it and you think, okay, this should do something like this, and it does that action. So this is what we call a perceived affordance. It's something that objects and interactions sometimes, uh, without us having to read anything, we're just looking at it, they tell us what they do. Sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes we need some experience or, or some different context to know exactly how to use a, a, an object. For example, a paperclip. The, the form of the, or the shape of the object is not clear, but once you understand what it does, you know exactly what it does. So you just use it to join pieces of paper together. But all of these affordances depend on context. A different person with different experience might look at this object and see a total different way to use it. I don't know if you know MacGyver, but he's the guy who could use a paperclip to defuse a bomb. So yeah, basic, depending on the context, the usage is very different uh, for the same object. Here's another example. At the top, you have this uh, jar of uh, eye drops. And on the bottom, we have a jar of super glue. The affordance of the object is perfect for both situations. You have a jar, which is solely function is to help you drop single drops of a liquid. They both work, uh, do, a, do a tremendous job at this. But if you mix the context, bad things can happen. So the affordance is perfect for the object, but the context is different. And when we talk about, about context, we need to talk about all the flavors that it has. So first, we have device context. It's clear that when you're using a mobile device or a computer, you have different contexts. But what about the new world of Internet of Things? We can now interact with a refrigerator. We can order food through a refrigerator on our, on our kitchen. And even operating systems provide us different contexts. Sometimes we do things differently on Android and on iOS. So even on mobile devices, we have different contexts. Also, the environment plays a, a big role. You can do either outdoor activities or indoor activities. The context is very different. Um, even noise, weather, etc. they have all impact on, the, on context. And even objects around us. For example, you might need some post-its next to your computer in order for you to do your job. So everything around you impacts context and the way we need to design things. Also, time. Uh, 
means that we use different devices at different times of the day. For example, if you look at tablets, you get a high usage during the evening for leisure activities. But if you look at uh, desktop computers, you get high usage during the day because people are working. And mobile devices have uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, occasional use every day throughout the day. So you go and check your messages, check your Facebook, whatever, very small interactions throughout the whole day. So um, then we have activity. And each activity may have its own context. For example, if you're looking to buy a car, you're going to do browse a lot of websites and search for information, probably search on different devices when you're commuting to, to, to home or to work, getting more information about the car you're going to buy. And for example, if you're cooking, you might have a device like a, a tablet next to you to show relevant information for what you're doing at the time. And activities may be composed of simple tasks or a group of very complex tasks. So depending on the activity, the context is also very different. We also have individual contexts, our personality, our state of mind, our likes and dislikes, um, our own knowledge and experience, as you, as you saw before with MacGyver, his knowledge and experience allowed him to look at a paperclip very differently than all of us. Um, we have the location context. Uh, for example, home versus work. We do different things at home and at work, even when using the same uh, applications. And some apps only work at uh, specific locations. For example, a bike sharing app only works, or the main uh, feature of the app only works when you're near a, a bike station. And finally, social context is um, everything that can be shared, content or devices. So if you use a shared device, you're going to have a lot more uh, care or, or going to be more careful about your personal information and you're going to log out every time you leave the, the, the computer. So all of this can have impact on the way we design things. And if you look at the first letter for each one of these flavors, you get the word details. It's all in the details. Um, every aspect of the interaction has a lot of things going on around the person that's using it. So we need to take in, in consideration all of those details in order to have a great user experience. So imagine this simple use case of a very good contextual design. Um, you're late for a meeting, you're running into the office, you don't know uh, which room is the meeting, who you're meeting with, you just, get a, a, you just know you're late. So the basic use case would be, I swipe up my phone, unlock it, find the calendar app, open it, open the meeting, look for information, shit's not there, I need to go to the mail to see who I'm talking to. So all hell breaks loose. Wah! All hell broke loose. <laughs> I really had a very good slide. It's the panda. Ah. <laughs> and I was messing with my presentation. So what is contextual design? The right thing to do would be, OK, I just look at my phone, and the information is there. I don't have to do anything. So if you look at it, this is already happening today. If I, if I look at my phone, at any, any given time, I know what's, what I have to do, uh, or it, tell, it tells me what, what I need to do. So in this example, it's not clear, but it tells me I have a meeting in 15 minutes at that location with that URL so that I can join it remotely. Even when I'm at home at a totally different context, it knows that I need to get to work at that time, and it shows me that information and also the quickest way to, go there, to get there. So this is what uh, we call about, we say it's contextual design, it's, but it's, always, uh, it's also at a glance design. So you don't have to do anything to get the information you need at the right time so that you can do whatever you, you need to do uh, without interruptions and quickly. 
So basically, a contextual product understands the full story of other hum around the human experience in order to bring uh, users exactly what they want with minimal interaction. OK, this, is, this was context. And now I have to explain you what we do here at TalkDesk. Um, at TalkDesk, we connect people. Someone dials a number, and we connect them to a professional on the other side that answers the call. We try to connect people with the, the right person on the other side. Uh, we need to make sure that when someone makes a call, in real time, we can find the best agent that, that can deal with the problem that that person is dealing with. So the caller has something that needs to be fixed, and we uh, connect him to the agent that has the better information or the better skills in order to solve that problem. And we do that with context. Uh, we know who is calling. We know why they're calling, because we get a lot of information about the call. Probably they went through some IVR system that uh, filtered the, the call. And also, we integrate with multiple systems in order to get information uh, about this call and uh, try to infer what it is about in order to connect it to the professional that has the better uh, skills to, to deal with it. So the, our main goal is that everybody gets happy. The person is calling gets the problem fixed. The agent deals with it very quickly because he doesn't have to go through all of those systems trying to get information about the customer. He doesn't have to ask too many questions. He already knows what's the problem and how to fix it. Speaking about the agent, this is one of our personas here at TalkDesk. Uh, the agent usually use, uh, needs to access very different applications in order to, to solve a caller's problem. We're talking about someone that's on the phone and needs to use three, four, five different applications in order to solve the customer's problem. Either be a billing applications, uh, custom applications for, for the, the company. Usually they have three or four applications they use at the same time. They often deal with people that are angry, uh, who need immediate solutions, so they need to be calm and need to, they, they need to provide the solution quickly. And also, they represent the brand that the caller is calling. So we try to make sure that agents have uh, uh, transpassed this uh, idea that, that the brand is something that the, the caller should have trust in it and not someone that is going to argue with the customer. So what we do here is start, try to help him take control of the conversation. Uh, giving it all the information that we have about this contact and also do some automations so that the agent doesn't have to do simple tasks. For example, when a call comes in, he, he doesn't have to create a ticket on, on Zendesk, for example, because we do that automatically. We can, we can create all of these automations so that agents have to deal only with the caller and not with these simple tasks, uh, repetitive tasks that should happen on every call. What agents use is what we call the call bar. It's a small widget, uh, a small application that runs on the desktop that integrates with CRMs, gets all the information about the contacts, uh, and also gives agents information about who, who is calling. We give, have a little space for contacts that shows all the information about the person that is calling me. How all of this started? At the beginning, uh, we had this interface, which was a, a web application, and we had all the experience in the browser. So we have a tab with TalkDesk, and agents should, could use that tab either to browse uh, the, all the contacts, call history, etc., and also to make and receive calls. What we figured out is that agents don't live on TalkDesk. They live on their CRMs, on their applications, where they do their work. So having to switch between tabs to uh, do some call controls, to pause or mute the, the conversation was not uh, real, a really good experience. Uh, 
So we moved on and talk, we thought about, okay, so if they live on Salesforce one or on Zendesk, let's move TalkDesk into, their, uh, into this environment. So we created Calvar inside CRM. So now agents don't have to leave or switch tabs between the CRM that they use every day and call controls because they can do it uh, on the same window. And then we thought, okay, what about customers that don't use Salesforce or Zendesk? We're missing here a great opportunity to have more customers that use other CRMs. So either we create a specific uh, call bar for each CRM or we evolve into a desktop application, it's, which is what we have right now. So the advantage is, is that this lives outside of the browser and it's, since it's an app, it can also integrate with the CRMs that it, that it, does, uh, that it did before, but use, agents don't have to switch between tabs. They can have it on top of every screen or even minimize it, just have the call controls and they can, can keep using the browser to do everything they, they need to do. So how do we use context with the call bar in TalkDesk? Usually say TalkDesk and context sitting on a tree. We love context. Uh, as I told you before, uh, it plays a big role here at TalkDesk. And it brings us some challenges. For example, how can we collect the, the right information for each call? How can we display that information to agents on real time when they're answering the call? So our main uh, challenge is when a call comes in, agents need to, know, to have immediate uh, access to the most relevant information about the caller. We don't have to give them all the information. We have to give them the relevant information about that specific call. I have here a small video from the movie, The Grand Budapest Hotel, that I think summarizes in a sentence what or how TalkDesk works. Let's see if this works. What is a lobby boy? A lobby boy is completely invisible, yet always in sight. A lobby boy remembers what people have paid. A lobby boy anticipates the client's needs before the needs are needed. A lobby boy is above all discreet to a fault. Our guests know their deepest secrets, some of which are frankly rather unseemly, will go with us to our graves. So keep your mouth shut, sir. Yes, sir. That's all for now. So. A lobby boy anticipates the client's needs before the needs are needed. This is basically what we do. So TalkDesk anticipates the agent's needs before the needs are needed. We give them the right information at the right time to deal uh, with the problem at hand. We're currently in the process of designing the new call bar, and I'm going to show you part of the process that we went through. But first, why do we need a new call bar? This is what we have right now. For example, this is the ringing screen. And as you can see, there's a little part that shows context uh, on Cobar. Uh, the real estate is really small and we don't have any easy way to extend this kind of information. It's either a key value pair where you have a title and a, and a, and a value and we cannot extend this to include uh, different kinds of information, actions that you could do with that information, uh, third party, uh, information that we could uh, handle to third-party developers. So we need, we get all the information and we, we display it like this today uh, in this small window. We also uh, thought about how can we add more context to agents? How can we integrate context from different multiple sources? Uh, to give information the, the, the to give agents the information they need, and also we figured that we have agents that keep jumping from the cover and talk desk website because we don't have everything on cover. We only do 
uh, calls, uh, make and receive calls. And some agents need some more information and they go to the talk desk website to get that information. So they keep switching between uh, these two apps that we have and how can we solve and try to, get, to give them all the information they need on Color. So we started with the design sprint. We actually did two design sprints for, for Color. And so we followed the, the typical steps. So uh, this was the second design sprint, the understanding phase where we created the user journey. We did some stakeholders interviews. Uh, we then moved on to the sketching phase, uh, storyboarding. Every person, they did a sketch. We, did, we, had, we had people from multiple departments, design, product, engineering, uh, sales. Then we moved on to the side phase. Uh, everybody presented their own sketches. We did, everybody voted on the ideas that they thought were better so to, to work on. On the next day, we did prototyping based on the ideas that we voted on the day before. And finally, we did the validation phase with stakeholders, interviews, and next steps to, to, to work next. After the design sprint, we did also did some user testing uh, to validate key points when uh, we developed on the design sprint. And we did presential and remote user testing. And the presential tests allowed us to know how agents use Colvar in the real world. And we found out that context is also very important with agents when agents are not on a call. Uh, usually contact centers have this big displays all around with metrics about call stats, queues, performance, uh, agent availability, etc. And this kind of information is used by agents for them to decide what they do after when they finish a call. For example, they usually look at uh, that kind of information that tells them how many agents are available. And they see, okay, if I have 400 agents available, then I can move on and do some other tasks like answering emails or responding to tickets on Zendesk. But if that metric says that there are only two agents available, then they prepare for a call that's coming next. So they don't usually do other stuff. They get prepared because they're going to get a call in a few seconds. So that's a big, uh, uh, that's something that they use in order to do to, to, to know exactly how they're going to do their work next. And sometimes contact centers have very big rooms and they don't have many uh, televisions like this. So they have one on each corner and some agents are really far away and they can't really see the numbers on, on, on these uh, wall boards. So we noticed that agents were switching between the, the live tab on top desk website and cover just to get that metric saying how many agents are on call or are available at this moment because they couldn't see it at a distance. Uh, so right now, Calvar doesn't provide any context when agent is not on a call. It just provides him with a dial pad in order for him to start a new call. And basically what we thought about is that how can we add also some context to agents while they're not, while they're not on a call? So we started working on uh, the prototypes and wireframes and figured this. Uh, for the new call bar, we wanted to bring all that we have on TalkTest website. For example, we thought about this main navigation here on the site where we can have different apps like the context, the call history, the voicemails that we don't have right now at the call bar. And then we have the conversation app where conversations are happening. And it, when, when, we speak about, speak, uh, when we speak about conversation, we're not speaking only about the voice. We're also preparing to do omni-channel, text, video, et cetera. That's why we call it omni-channel and not calls. And then when an agent is on a call, we can use these cards to show them contextual information about the caller. And uh, 
also some call stats that can, you can use to, to, uh, to know how the call is going. And also we introduced this concept of the home app, which is when the, an agent is not on a call, he gets some, also some useful information on what's happening on the, on the contact center so, they have, so that he can have some context about what he can do next. So this is some examples of what we are working on. This is a ringing screen. As you can see, uh, we have a lot of information here. We know who is calling. We know the reason they're calling. We know how many, how long they're being on, on wait. Uh, we get some information about the call details and we can also integrate with third parties so that we can have context about who this person is and what's his, uh, uh, what kind of information do we have in, on our own system. For example, this would be uh, a company that deals with some kind of product that has subscriptions. So I know that this person is calling me about a billing issue and she has this product subscribed. So even without answering the call, I already know what's going, what's going to happen. What, what will be the, the, the dialogue that I'm going to have with this person. While I'm on a call, we can also have uh, the same information and also more cards with details about these contacts, like the contact details. And also uh, we can add actions to that content. Not only we provide the information, we can also provide ways for agents to quickly click something and either opening the correct system that they use to fix that problem or just open a browser window with more information about that, that contact. So not only we provide uh, data, we provide also actions for them to, to do. And about we, don't, um, we don't only show cards, we can also show all the interaction that we had with this person before. In the journey tab, for example, we can know exactly how many times this person called me before. And we can also integrate with third party systems in order for, for, the, for the agent to know uh, which orders this person placed before. So I get all the information from past interactions that I had with this person just by clicking on the journey tab. And finally, we have the home screen where agents can configure this to, to have the information that they need in order to do their work. Like I said before, this was the, the main metric that they used to, to know exactly what they wanted to do next. So we created a small card with that small information. They don't need the whole reporting tab that they have on the website. They just need the small metric in order to do their work. So, and this can all, can all be configured by the admin or the supervisor or even the agent in itself to have the right information that he needs at the right time. For example, we can also have a card to display the trending topics. If we know there are many people calling today about some subject, we can warn agents to know, okay, there are many calls today about billing issues. And we can also provide them a link to the knowledge base to know how to deal with this type of calls. So agents know that today they're going to get a lot of calls about that and they already know how to fix that issue without having received any call at all. So this is a small glimpse of what we do here at TalkDesk. Um, this is just the agent experience uh, where we integrate context, but we have also other personas where we integrate like the admin or the supervisor. Um, and we would love to get to know you better. And if you like to join the team, uh, come join, come uh, talk to us at the end uh, and thank you. Now it's a turn from uh, Hugo Freus, and he's going to talk about the importance of contacts in research. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, too close. No, it's good. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Paul, for the invite. Uh, I just want to say one thing. 
I'm probably going to repeat some of the things that Ivo has already said, um, because like he did, he gave you all context about context. <laughs> so some of the things I will be repeating, um, but in a different angle. So I'm Hugo. Um, Hugo Farage. I work at Codacy. Uh, I'm now working in the research, uh, on the product research, uh, along with the product design team. And if you want to find me on Twitter, that's me, Hugo Farage UX. Um, and let's go. So what do we mean by context? So the definition, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea in terms of which it can be fully understood. Sounds a bit formal, doesn't it? Let's go in a different direction. I want you all to imagine your favorite series, your favorite program on Netflix or any other program. Now, you've been watching it for four seasons. You've invested your time. You've invested your emotions. You know those characters better than you know your own family. Okay? You really know it well. This fifth season is about to come. You're really excited. You're, re you're, you're gearing for it. You have full context. You know everything about the series. You know if a character changes his mind, if he starts acting in a different way, you know that something's going wrong. That's not right. You have full context. So if we think about context, we have to take into consideration, looking at it a different way. Number one, obviously, the user. If we're talking business to business, we have to consider their position. Are they the boss or are they the person working? Okay, um, their responsibilities, how do they fit into the company, workflows, etc. We have the location, is it indoors, outdoors, where's the environment that they're going to be in, or in the car, in a bus, etc. Actual geographic location, okay, that can be an influence because culture. Then, comfort level, are they sitting on a sofa, are they walking in the street, are they buzz moving around inside a bus, all this can affect their experience. And then emotions, okay? Are they angry? If you are a helpline application or product, people are going to be stressed when they use your application or your product. You have to think about that. You can't leave it as an afterthought. And then why is context important? Okay, this is where we start going to the part of why this talk is. So the worst misstep one can make is to solve the wrong problem. If you don't think about context, that's basically the thing. You're not going to solve the right problem. So now you've just presented your significant other, your best friend, whatever, to that program. And you want them to watch it for you, with you because you love it. They should love it too. Or else you have nothing to discuss next time you get together. And they say, sure, I'll watch it, whatever. You sit down and they start saying, that character's stupid. I don't like him. Why is that one angry with that one? I don't understand it. You get irritated. But he doesn't have the same context you do. He hasn't built it up over the years. Unless you can get him to sit down for the full seasons of everything, he's not going to have the full context. Some other examples where context was important. I can't find the right key. If we're talking about a person, it's a person looking for their car keys, looking for their house keys. If we're talking about a musician, we're talking about the right note. Imagine if he can't find the key while he's talking, playing in an orchestra in the middle of a concert. Two, free of charge. Sounds great when we're talking about sales, retail. Yeah, I'm not going to pay anything for it. Terrible when our battery dies. It's got no charge. I have a new boyfriend. Perfectly normal when talking about a couple. Not something you want to hear in prison. <laughs> we're not going to discuss semantics it's all details everyone knows the options they'd want to make it's not up to me it, but it could be important imagine if you're interviewing someone the context would be very different so basically designing with context in mind can improve the experiment, experience for the users the ease of use the, of the interface more relevant content a personalized experience exactly what sets us apart from the competition if you want to look at it that way because if we design for context, we're designing for exactly what the user needs, when he needs it, how he needs it, and the best way to use it. Context forgotten. What happens when we forget about context, when we're building the product, when we're doing our research? 
A few examples. Okay, obviously they didn't think about that. Two, stairs. Okay, apparently accessibility is changing. Shri that. It's, okay. I don't know where this is posted. Maybe I don't have context enough, but it seems a bit ridiculous. If a person is blind, we're not going to speak louder. What's your step once again? Okay. For people in wheelchairs. Um, so, left, ladies' bathroom. Right, not men's bathroom. Fire exit. Apparently, this would set off an alarm every time someone would open the door. Restrooms, behind a glass, in braille. Okay. Barbershop, great decoration until you have hair falling in it. So apparently we can follow Anne Frank and find out what book she's going to be coming out with next. Yep. And I'm sure we've all seen this. I think Paul has actually shared this on the... UX Lisbon a few months back. It just goes on a loop. Okay, it's great. It's great. If you want to sit there watching, it's relaxing. You know, you sit down there, just watch it for a while. It's relaxing. So, why should we leverage context? Okay, how can we leverage it to make it better, to make the product better? Going back to our Netflix uh, metaphor, with context, so now we have context. You've sat down. You've given a full PowerPoint presentation to your friend. You've gone through all the key points and you've given him a cheat sheet of each character, their personalities and how they interact. You're happier together. You can now share that series together or not. You discover he's not the right friend for you. Can happen too. So we can create a customized journey based on the user journey. Imagine being able to impact him at the right moment with the right message or with the right interaction. So we take into consideration their journey. Customized based on user actions, depending on the action he's creating. At that moment, is he hailing a cab? Is he talking to someone? Is he asking for something at a place? Obviously, customize user interaction. Then, obviously, customize user experience. The messages we present the user with, the way we talk with them, the way they feel, the context, the emotion, everything inside our product, it's important. Okay. Just gonna go quickly over this, okay? Where has context been important for us? So when we were doing the research, we discovered we had two main target audiences. Number one, developer engineer. So basically, this is a person who has strong opinions, very strong opinions. Wants your product to work in the background and not bother their workflow on a day-to-day -day basis. Wants to know where to focus their time. They don't want to waste time on stupid things. Hates false positives. Okay, they hate it. Especially when you're considering that, by the way, let me just give some background. Codacy analyzes your code to see what's wrong with it. So if you give a lot of false positives, I can see that as negative. Defends open source, okay? They do defend it a lot. And they hate being controlled. They want freedom. They don't want their boss on top of them. Then we have the managers and the CTOs. They also use our product, okay? They want to have a clear idea of the state of the product projects. So they want to control engineers. They want to understand the evolution of their code quality when we're talking about obviously codacy. And they need to inform decisions based on what they can obtain from codacy. And last, they need to present the data to others. So what we did was we had to focus and we created new dashboards. The new dashboards um, focused had obviously a beautiful dashboard for the CTOs and the managers where they get a general idea of how their projects are going, of how their, their team is developing and how code quality is evolving over the course of a series of months and even can give you so, some sort of prediction about how code quality will maintain. On the other spectrum, 
for developers, you've got the personal dashboard, which gives you an idea of how you're doing as a, de a developer, but it also gives you hotspots. So what do I need to focus on next? What have I broken? Where can I make it better? And he can just focus on what he needs to focus on, which is getting the job done. So he can go see the issues, he can go see the, the pull requests, everything, and see how they're going, what the errors are, and how to fix them if he needs to. And that's how it was important, the context. So thanks. Any questions, not now, at the end. And have fun. Thanks. <laughs>Hi there. Okay, so I got this invitation to talk about context and uh, I just went back and tried to figure out exactly how, where this centered our history at uh, developing user experience at, at out systems. Uh, so I, find, I found a few things uh, and added a few stories and also bring some advice. So getting started. So, Okay, I'll win this one. So I have the company name in the second slide of the presentation. Um, but this for, it's for a good reason. It's uh, context for the presentation. So all systems builds a, a development platform. So it enables people to build web and mobile applications really, really fast, okay? So our business is basically to sell this platform to businesses and they build apps which provide value to them. Okay, either internally for their employees or partners or uh, clients. Uh, so the top thing here is, and became obvious along the way, was that you need to get these apps adopted by, or in production and adopted by the users of the customers to provide value and to justify the cost of this investment. So a while ago, we launched something called the Great Apps Program. So the Great Apps Program was something, um, so was a program that intended to work with a lot of our teams using the platform, delivering, delivering um, projects or applications. So basically we devised a way of, so how could a few people in UX just help out a set of people working in projects, delivering applications and uh, making sure that they're adopted by the end users uh, of those applications. So we created a checklist. Okay? So that sounds weird, but basically this was extremely effective. And what we're seeing here is actually the second version of that checklist. On the first version of the checklist, we had no context. Okay? So, and I'll get back to that. How could we have no context and just try to help teams uh, figuring out exactly what they needed to do uh, to have their applications adopted. So basically we went to the teams and we figured out exactly, so we pushed them um, to do a set of stuff. And one of the things we did was, uh, in the second version, was to focus on users. So you could do just what you could and, for example, try to get contacts from stakeholders uh, or at least get some recording of how the users worked currently. You could do a bit better and you could collect uh, metrics. Um, you could advise creating some sort of personas from the, mat from the information you got, or you actually, you would uh, jump on the plane and uh, go visit where the users worked, okay? And this was amazing to us. It really depended on the projects, the budget available of what you could do. So, this, is actually, this was actually like a, a great thing of this new version of a checklist to help them do a better job, was to know your users. Um, and this is weird, right? So how can you build usability without knowing the user? So this um, made me thought, uh, made me think, and basically there's a set of aspects that you can bring to an application that allow it to be a great app or to have great usability, okay? And we ended up creating this sort of model to try to explain it. So there are a few layers. These aren't physical layers. These are just things that you need to worry about as you add usability into your application. And they work on top of each other. So let me take it through it. So we have the instinctive layer. So the instinctive layer is really about 
how the brain works. So we're designing software for humans and we need to be working um, we, in mind with how humans work. So I'm going to do a small test. Who saw the leopard? Okay, so the ones that did not see the leopards should not be here today, according to Darwin. Okay, so you should you would have been eaten. So the thing is that the brain works in patterns. So they try to figure out exactly what are the patterns in front of you, and they try to figure out what's not or breaking the pattern. This is actually very useful in some situations working in the applications. Let me give you another example. We're going to do an exercise. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone has like a sheet of paper with stuff written on them, but I'm going to invite you to put your finger just in front of the text if you have like a written paper, okay? If not, I'll walk you through it. Is, is anyone doing it? Yeah? Yeah. So you need to focus on your nail, and now you're going to use your peripheral vision to try to read the text around it. Can you do it? Probably not. So the thing is, this is really smart. We think that we live in a world which is all clear, okay? No blurs or anything. The thing is that the retina moves so fast that it actually makes you believe that all the work is in all the world is in focus. This is a lie. Okay? So the thing is that when you decide where to look, you're making that decision in an unfocused world. Yeah? Can you think about the implications of this? So the way you structure a web page depends on how users read the information on that page in an unfocused world, in a blurred world, okay? So this is why you cluster information, you provide titles, and that's how you allow the user to manage navigation and not make it like a huge cognitive burden on them. So it becomes this, and it actually justifies why this happens. So probably you know this, this is from eye tracking uh, from a while back actually, and it just tracks the eye to fake to understand where it's focusing at. And you'll see jumps, just jump, the eye jumping from cluster to cluster. This is exactly what he's doing. He's trying to decide exactly where to go next. And this is how he navigates information in the page. Okay. So another important, really important thing to know is about uh, this gentleman called Gestalt, uh, which published a set of works in the beginning of last, of beginning of last century. Uh, and they're now called the Gestalt Laws. Does everyone know them? Yeah? Okay, a few. So the thing is, he basically understood a lot of the things of how the brain works, of how we, we understand information in front of us. So we understood that, for example, elements which are closer together are probably related. Uh, elements which are in the line completely uh, in alignment are probably related as well. This has huge impact on the way that you can structure stuff on the page. And all this in work actually creates like the visual hierarchies in which you process pages, uh, in which you can make, make the processing of information more, of a, more or easier. Okay, so the first thing, and this is easily forgotten, we start talking about, okay, we need to talk to users and it's going to be an amazing experience. So sometimes there are other things which don't need context, which provide great experiences, okay? So I advise you to learn about how the brain works. One of the cool things about it is that, you know that developers are really hard to work with, right? Yes. So the thing is, is sometimes the relation is really complicated. One of the things they respect is mastery. So if you have stuff that you know a lot about that they don't like how the brain works, it's actually very impressive. So you get to win a lot of credit out of that. Okay, so the second one is cultural. And we're going to do another test. So what do you think is, this is a web page, okay, of a regular website. What do you think uh, is behind the red box? A logo, yeah. Okay, so you didn't, you weren't born with that one, right? Uh, so what happened, uh, or what can happen behind the orange box? Sorry? The menu or search box, something like that, yes. And the green box? Price, okay. 
or a shopping cart or user information, something like that, right? So we, we weren't born with this information, right? So we just picked up along the way as we consumed information as we were, from the time we were born. And we just came to expect stuff to be in certain places. So if you be, want to be really innovative, you just can shuffle those around. It's going to be a really stressful experience for your user. Okay? So you need to be mindful of conventions. Another exercise. What do you think this is? License plate. Wow, without labels. This one. Phone number. You're good. Third one. Credit card. Male, female. Okay. And what does the asterisk say? Sorry? Mandatory? So actually, this is no one wrote that this was supposed to be mandatory. This is in no spec of the, the World Wide Web whatsoever. Okay. So basically, someone just thought of, okay, just let's put something here in red so that people can understand that they need to fill this in. And it actually picked up. Okay. So eventually, a convention in our culture um, starts being formed and we just picked up about it. So the thing is, so if you're trying to make a great application and that makes it easier for the user, even without context, you can still do a lot. So you can design for how the brain works, how it processes information, and you can design for the conventions. Okay? So this isn't actually true. Even working with conventions, you might need context. If you're working for a set of users which, work, which are in their specific context, they use their own lingo. And sometimes that becomes a convention that you need to be aware of, okay? So moving up layers. So th those were more like behavioral layers. This is the intentional layer and it's where context kicks in. So just designing for the brain and convention is not enough for great usability. So we need to do a few more decisions. So just let's pick up on the web page again. So we have a table. And now you're tasked and you're supposed to do the brilliant mobile version of your web application. So which columns do you cut to fit into mobile? I have no idea. Also because it's an abstract exercise. So let's go into that. So as we rolled out user experience design through uh, our own projects working with customers, uh, we started as so I showed you, we start pushing for uh, the projects teams to go where the users are. Sometimes the users were here in the car shop. So in this project, we were basically developing like an insurance uh, system. Um, and until we started doing this, basically all the screens had just a couple identifiers. They were basically either a claim number or an account identifier. Okay. So we start doing this and trying to figure out exactly what's the life of the users. Um, and as we went to the car shop, what do you think the identifier is for an insured, insured good in this context? The license plate. So we were closed in our buildings and just doing the screens, okay? Uh, talking to people, stakeholders, stuff like that. And everything was up to their context. But as we went to the context of the users, some things just screamed at us. And this revolutionized how the software was used in this context particularly. Okay. So another example. In this case, um, we were doing a performance evaluation system for a big supermarket chain uh, here in Portugal. And basically, so for, for a performance evaluation, you have two important things, which is, so the employee needs to log in with their personal account or the, yeah, their account, and it needs to fill in their self-evaluation, stuff like that. The manager needs to come in and evaluate everyone in their team. So as we went to the supermarket where people worked, this was, these were actually the only two computers that existed there. And the account, the manager account is always logged in because people come here in the run and just do an order for some item. So all our ideas about creating this log, log, um, performance evaluation system based on logged in, or logins were just trashed, right? Because people can just come here with the account already logged in of the manager and do their evaluation and maybe look at stuff on the site. 
So this basically changed the whole perspective of how we were building this system. So this guy is actually allowed the VP of digital and he's, he, the, the only reason he's there is because of context. It's a joke, sorry. Okay, so another example on the importance of context. This actually came up with uh, someone who shared this in training, which had a personal experience. So we spent one to two years developing a software for sales, okay? So at some point at the end of the project, he was doing the training for the sales guys to start using the system. At some point, one guy got up, he left the room and he went to do a call. Nothing weird about that, right? He came back and he said, Tiago, okay, you can stop there. And he said, okay, so we're doing a break? No, 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 no. I just talked to the CEO and told them we're not using this. And that was it. <laughs> the project died there. Okay. So a lot of time you build software, which is lousy to users, but basically what they do is you be, they become more frustrated. They go home and eat more ice cream and stuff like that. But in some cases they have power. And when they have power, uh, stuff, interesting stuff happens when you don't you do your job properly. So these are a few stories on context and the importance of context. So it's going, just going through into the top layer. The top layer is when you reduce the distance to your user. So basically you try to anticipate their needs and leverage extra context like Eva was talking about. So that you can leverage location or um, other things. Have you learned about this? What Google is rolling out? The smart compost? So basically they're using artificial intelligence to just fill in whatever you're trying to write, just offering suggestions of what you probably will say. Okay. So this is the kind of, the kind of uh, experience which moves closer to the user, leveraging their own context to just make their life easier, which is amazing. Okay. I won't go too much to this one. But basically this, all, this is all about creating amazing experiences. Who knows this guy? Ah, you know it. I was afraid of the generation gap already. Uh, yes, I'm old. Um, so this was Clipper. It appeared in uh, a few Microsoft products ahead of, their, of its time because it had almost no context ability. Uh, and basically it just suggested the stupidest things at the weirdest times and it was just annoying. So the thing is, and the message here, which is highly appropriate to this setting is, if you have no context, don't do Flipper, okay? Don't try to outsmart without users without context. So don't do this. Okay, so just looking to this model again. So we have a few layers which are essential for you to do great apps and provide great usability. And these actually don't need a lot of context and you should really know about them. There are other things, if you really want to do a great application that you need to be aware of and you need to go to your users and figure out exactly what are their contexts. You won't always be able to go to, their us to the users exactly where they are. We know this because the people tell us a lot. Okay, so sometimes we went to the market and tried to figure, okay, to hire senior UXers. And they have a huge uh, career doing UX. And then we talk about UX research and they say, okay, I, don't, <laughs> I have no permission to talk to user whatsoever. Okay. And that's a huge problem. It's not something that we haven't faced. So one, one time um, I was tasked to do uh, the private training to a CIO of a company for him to try to figure out exactly what this usability thing was like. And at some point he stopped me and he said, okay, I don't want any of this. The users will work as I tell them to work. Okay. So he eventually came around, um, but we are aware of this stuff. We do have a few success stories and this is taking a page from Steve Krug and don't make me think. Have you read the book? Yes. One hand. That's dramatic. Ah, okay. 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 Almost 10. So this is an amazing book to read. It takes like one to two hours and it gives you a bunch of insight about usability. I highly recommend it. One of the most important lessons there for you to try to bring usability into the company is actually to 
do a, a few usability tests. They don't need to be with real users, just create context and try to run it and record it. And then just pass it through in a room where you attract stack stakeholders with food. And as they're, as they're eating and they start seeing their own software running in the TV, they just stand up like this. So the thing is, they're probably seeing for the first time users using the software. At one instance, this one didn't have food. There was a director of a, a known site and she just jumped at the TV yelling, that's not, that's not how you use the search, okay, to the recording, yeah? That's when it clicked. <laughs> and she figured out that, okay, maybe we need to do something else so that we don't need to tell users when they're using the software, okay, don't do that. Okay, so like I, so, like I show you from the, the, the checklist, there are actually a, a lot of degrees in which you can get context. So if you have no ability to go much further, at least try to interview, to interview internal stakeholders. Try to get as much context as you can from the people which got closer to them. You can try to use uh, user proxies. If there are trainers on the, in the house, support areas, stuff like that. Um, or you can try to go to the customers and eventually talk to users. If you're, really, if you're really lucky about where you're working, you can actually do field studies or something amazing, which is get immersed on the context of the client and just spend time there and breathe the same air as they're breathing. Okay? And that's, that's where magic happens. So what are my suggestions for you to get started on this? So one, and I hope I helped you here, is that believe in the power of context. Context can be world shifting, okay? can make you see things that you never would uh, any, any, in any other way. So go Google Gorilla and try to figure out how you get access to the users, okay? There's one lesson that served me well, um, which is to ask for forgiveness and not permission. So there's a few colleagues of mine here and probably they know a few of my success stories. They don't know the ones that failed. <laughs> So the thing is that when you have the best intention of heart, this usually goes through. You try stuff, you go against the rules, but when the results come in, things start to, to change. So don't be quiet about what you're able to achieve. If you're getting there, just try to share the insights, probably some, at first not with managers, um, but with the teams and try to leverage that information. Make them excited about it. Share then your wins, okay? And this is exactly the, basically the recipe for a fight. And you might be nervous about it, but the thing is, and I love this quote about this lady, uh, which was an anthropologist, an anthropologist, a student of our society. And she said, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. And what I'm, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you should go out and change the world, but you are able to change the organization you're in, okay? And sometimes it's okay to break a rule or two. They'll even promote you for that sometimes. If they don't, okay, and if you do get in trouble, you need to start figuring out if you're in the right company, okay? You need to start figuring out if you're in a company that's going to reward you to do what the company needs, although they don't know it. And that's it.